Jesus, um, all the way up to where they were just filled with rage, and they ended up murdering a deacon named Stephen. And um, Stephen's murder really began, um, that, that began the, the persecution of the church there in Jerusalem, and, and it really marked the start of Saul's path of terror on the church. And as we'll see today, Saul's life did change, and it, it had a radical change. It was totally transformed when he encountered Jesus on his way to Damascus. Um, I want to read Philippians 3, 7 through 9. Paul says this later in his life. He says, But whatever gain I had, I counted as loss for the sake of Christ. Indeed, I count everything as lost because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. For his sake, I have suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish in order that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which comes through faith in Christ, the righteousness from God that depends on faith. Let's pray. Uh, Father, as we gather this morning, um, it is so good just for our hearts to sing your praise. It's so good to gather together as the church, as your people, and lift our voices to sing of your goodness, sing of your grace, sing of, sing of your love for us, to sing the name of Jesus. We thank you for that opportunity. We thank you for the breath that you've given us to do that. And now as we continue to worship through, through the preaching of your word, I just ask that you would be at work, that your spirit would move in our hearts this morning, that we would truly have an encounter with you this morning that will not leave us the same. We thank you for the life of Saul. We thank you for your grace in his life, for the way you saved him and rescued him. May we learn much about your grace through his life. May we learn a lot about Jesus this morning. And it's in his name that we ask. Amen. So question for you this, this morning. Uh, with fall starting, um, one of the things that happens in the fall is hunting season begins. Any, any hunters here this morning? Any deer hunters? Okay, we got a few. All right. So y'all like to kill Bambi. All right. Uh-huh. Yeah. No, uh, so uh, I'm, you know, deer season just started not this weekend, last weekend, bow season. Has anybody actually been hunting yet? Any bow hunters here? Wow. Man, dedication. So I, I'm, I'm not, I'm not going to, I'd hit as, I, I can't track a deer that well. I want to wait till gun season and maybe have a chance then. But I'm not a very good hunter. I'm not. Um, I just, you know, one of the things that you have to be able to do to be a really good hunter is you got to be able to, to really commit. you got to be in the woods. you got to wake up really early before dawn, like 4.30, and get up there and get in your stand and, and sit for like six hours. And, man, I, like I'm lucky to sit for like 20 minutes. Like, so, so really my idea of, uh, of hunting is just walking around in the woods with a gun. Like, that's kind of, I'm going to go hunting. It's like, are you just walking? Like, I'm, sometimes I'll, like, dress like this and wear, like, blaze orange hat, and I'm just kind of, like, walking around. And then, like, oh, I, I see one. It runs away because it saw me way first. And I'm just not a very good hunter. I'm not dedicated. I'm not passionate. I'm not committed to it. And that's, and that's really why I've only, I've only gotten one deer in my life. I've only taken one deer. And, and I've really, I've been hunting for the last nine years. Um, but just got one. And that was, like, a total fluke, like, I saw it, and it saw me. It actually saw me first, and then it didn't run. It's like, oh, thank you, God. My God. And so I got one. I finally got one. I was, I was really pumped. Um, you know, so, you know, if it's windy, I don't hunt. If it's too cold, I don't hunt. If it's rainy, I don't hunt. Um, I'm just not dedicated. But some guys, man, they're dedicated. They, like, live it. They, they like, move into the woods for three months, right? It's like, all right, it's hunting season. I'll see you in the spring. Like, that's kind of, like, they're just all in on hunting. You know, they say, I don't go hunting, I go killing. 
Like that's, and they do, they get multiple deer every year. They know how to do all the scent blocker and then they, they concoct it. Like they become into like chemical engineers and they concoct all these scents and hang them in trees and like this will draw them in because the pheromone, blah, 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 urine, blah, blah, blah. like what is going on? Like I'm just walking around with, you know. So these guys know what they're doing. I had a buddy of mine, he was, he's kind of like the craze type. And so he ends up pouring the, the, the dough pee on his boots He's like, yeah, this will help. This will help block the scent. I'm like, what do you do? Like, just like he's he's that crazy about it. He's so he's like, as I walk, maybe the buck will find. Me. Like, I'm I just they're crazy. They know all about what it what needs to be done to 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 get a deer. They're passionate. They're hunting machines. And Saul is that kind of hunter. Saul is that kind of hunter. He's passionate. He's dedicated. There's nothing he'd rather be doing than hunting down his prey. And his prey were followers of Jesus. And he's committed to finding them, searching them out and finding them, and taking them down and taking them out. We're going to be in the book of Acts. We're going to start in Acts chapter 8. I encourage you to open up your your Bible, your device, um, or look over this way. This is actually a ploy to try to get more people to sit on this side of the auditorium. Um, so here, here we go. Acts 8, 1 through 3, it says this. This is right after Stephen's execution. It says, And Saul approved of his execution. And there arose on that day a great persecution against the church in Jerusalem. And they were all scattered throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria, except the apostles. Devout men buried Stephen and made great lamentation over him. But Saul was ravaging the church. And entering house after house, he dragged off men and women and committed them to prison. After Stephen's murder, you know, Saul just went all in. Uh, He was no longer content just holding the coats or looking after the possessions of the other guy. No, he wanted to get his hands dirty. So he's now going full throttle. Um, that, that, that phrase, Saul was ravaging the church. Other translations say he was making havoc to the church. He, he laid waste to the church. He was destroying the church. That's the, that, that's the, as we capture that, that he, was, he was really passionate about destroying followers of Jesus. Paul would later describe himself um, in Acts 29, 9 through 11. He says this, I myself was convinced that I ought to do many things opposing the name of Jesus of Nazareth. And I did so in Jerusalem. I not only locked up many of the saints in prison, After receiving authority from the chief priests, but when they were put to death, I cast my vote against them. And I punished them often in all the synagogues and tried to make them blaspheme. And in raging fury against them, I persecuted them even to foreign cities. He was he was a cold hearted guy. He's he's Jesus hating, he's violent. He's self-righteous. He's intent on seeing them be murdered. Like if you were to just think about Jesus for just a moment, Saul's pretty much everything that's not that. Like no love, no grace, no mercy in his vocabulary. Raging fury, violent. He wants to bind them, drag them off. He's a brute. He's a cold-hearted brute. And soon the hunting grounds of Jerusalem were not big enough for him. And so he's going to go out, he's going to go beyond that place in his violent rage and continue to hunt down Christians. Acts 9, 1 and 2 says this, But Saul, still breathing threats and murder against the disciples of the Lord, went to the high priest and asked him for letters to the synagogues at Damascus, so that if he found any, belonging to the way, men or women, he might bring them bound to Jerusalem. You know, it's interesting to notice, Saul didn't wait for, for those leaders to tell him to go. 
Like he went and asked them, like, please, let, let me go get them. Like he's, he's really motivated. He's, he's, really, uh, he's really passionate about this. He, he's not going to for, for, wait for them to tell him. He's going to ask them to give me permission. Let me go. He's, like, he's just like a, a dog on a leash. Just let me go. Let me go get him. And so they let him go. They give him the authority to go to Damascus and begin persecuting Christians there. That's just how committed he was. And it's interesting that, that, that Saul wants to go to Damascus because Damascus is actually 150 miles away. Like Knoxville is only 120 miles away. If you take the interstate, it's only 120 miles away. He's willing to travel by foot 150 miles so he can hunt down Christians, drag them back to Jerusalem so they can stand trial and he can cast his vote against them as blasphemers so that they can be put to death. Like how much do you have to hate someone to walk 150 miles? Like that's his heart. That's, that's how all in, how committed he is. But Saul was ready to make the walk. He, he, he couldn't rest, not till the way was exterminated and destroyed. And it's interesting that followers of Jesus at this point are called the way, um, not just Christians, that would come later, but uh, the way really, it, it, it points a direction in life. And it reminds us what Jesus taught. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. And so that the early Christians, they would identify themselves as on the way. They were following Jesus. And now, during this time, uh, it's, it'd be pretty easy for the church to, to, to kind of wonder, like, God, what's, what's going on here? Hey, we're following you. We're, we, we've seen this awesome growth. But now this persecution, now this suffering, where are you? It'd be easy to think that God was actually idle or absent during this time. But all the while, God is actually at work. He's doing something very, uh, very strategic even. The truth is that, that while Saul was hunting down Christians, Christ was hunting down Saul. And we see that in Acts 9, 3 through 5. It says this, now, as he, Saul, went on his way, he approached Damascus, and suddenly a light from heaven shone around him, and falling to the ground, he heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And he said, who are you, Lord? And he said, I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. Like, can you, can you imagine this scene? Like Saul is kind of approaching Damascus, almost like a, a heavyweight fighter approaches the, the, big, the ring for the big fight. Like he's got his entourage in the back, and he's like, he's kind of like, you know, Damascus is on the horizon, and he's like getting close. He maybe even starts to kind of like rehearse his like interrogation questions, like kind of going through it in his head. And he's like, you know, uh, who's your savior? If they say G Jesus, lock them up, arrest them. Is Jesus alive? You're crazy. Have them arrested. Lock them up. Do you believe Jesus is God? Blasphemy. I'll have you stoned for that. Like he's kind of like all that's rolling around his head as he's coming to this new hunting ground. And then, boom, a light shone from heaven and he's on the ground. He's knocked out way before he even makes it in the ring. He's laying on the ground, shell-shocked. And, and Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? Who, who are you, Lord? And the, and the word Lord, he's just saying, like, like, who are you, sir? It's a term of respect. It's not that he recognized it was Jesus, but who, who are you, Lord? I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. Like, I really wish the next verse in the Bible just uh, was, was what came into Saul's mind in that instant. Like, can you imagine? And, and then Saul thought, oh, shoot. Like, like that's, no, I am Jesus whom you are persecuting. Like, oh, wow. Oh, boy. 
I'm in deep, deep, deep doo-doo, right? Like, that, like that's, that's a big deal. But at, at least two things must have, like, exploded into Saul's mind in that, in that moment when Jesus spoke to him. Like, the first, for, Jesus is alive. Okay, he's, Jesus, you're speaking to me. That, that means you're alive, right? So Saul now knows Jesus is alive. And if Jesus is alive, then all the claims that Jesus was teaching are actually true and the followers of Jesus were actually right and the gospel message is actually true. The message that that Jesus is God, that Jesus is the Christ, that on the cross he was dying in our place, the righteous one for all the unrighteous, that Jesus is the Savior, And that he is the only one who is able to reconcile sinners before a holy God. It's not about his performance. It wasn't about his religiousness or his own righteousness. But it's only about the grace that Jesus gives. There had to be a moment when when Saul is realizing, so basically everything I've dedicated my life to has been wrong. Very wrong. And not, not just wrong, but it's, it's, it's been bad. It's been very bad. Like, evil might be a more accurate word because I've destroyed a lot of families and I've put a lot of these followers of Jesus to death. So, I mean, that's, that's kind of the realization that's happening. And the second thing is Saul is learning that he was not just attacking followers of Jesus, but he was persecuting Jesus himself. Jesus gives Saul this quick theology lesson about the relationship between Jesus' followers and, and, and himself, that they are united, that we are in Christ and Christ is in us. And so that's why Jesus tells Saul, Saul, you are persecuting me. That's, that's this wonderful and yet terrifying truth and that's also what Jesus taught. Matthew 25, 40, Jesus says, And truly I say to you, whatever you do to the least of these, my brothers, you did it to me. You did it to me. That's not just symbolic, but that's, that's the actual relationship between the church and Jesus. And so the way you treat your brothers and sisters in Christ is the way you are treating Jesus himself. And that's the terrifying part, that when we insult or ignore or gossip about or neglect another Christian, that we're doing that to Christ. The way you treat other Christians is the way you are treating Jesus. And Saul has been persecuting Jesus over and over again. So Saul is still lying in the dirt, probably quivering and shaking, and, and, and Jesus continues. Acts 9, 6 through 9 says, Jesus continues, But rise, enter the city, and you will be told what you are to do. The men traveling with him stood speechless, hearing the voice but seeing no one. Saul rose from the ground, and although his eyes were open, he saw nothing. So they led him by the hand and brought him into Damascus. And for three days he was without sight and neither ate nor drank. Obviously Saul had a lot to think about, but Jesus was was showing Saul his blindness. The physical blindness that he's now experiencing is helping him realize the spiritual blindness that he's always had. He's been blind. And Saul's entourage finally kind of gained their composure and, and, and lead Saul by hand into the city. And, th- and this is where the story gets really interesting. Um, Acts 9, 10 through 12. Now there was a disciple at Damascus named Ananias. And the Lord said to him in a vision, Ananias. And he said, here I am, Lord. And the Lord said to him, rise and go to the street called Straight. And at the house of Judas, look for a man of Tarsus named Saul. 
for behold, he is praying. And he has seen in a vision a man named Ananias come in and lay his hands on him so that he might regain his sight. What an interesting conversation. Like you can uh, imagine this with me, you know, just Jesus calling down, Ananias, here I am, Jesus. How you doing? Hey, I, I, need, I need you to go down to Straight Street. You know where that's at? Yeah, I know where that's at, boss. What, what, what's there? Well, go, go and find the house of Judas. Can you do that? I can do that. Anything for you, Lord, I can do that. All right, now, now once you get there, look for a man of Tarsus. Okay, I got it. I'm going to write that down. His name is Saul. Tarsus, Saul. The, the Saul? The Saul from Tarsus? The one that's, that's been terrorizing the church? That's like you can almost, you can almost hear Ananias just like, like gulp. Like, oh, like this is, that's a fearful moment. The hunted usually don't go to the hunter, right? You want me to go minister to Saul? Even though Saul came here to murder me? That, that's what you're asking? Like this would be like if, if, if a hunter got lost in the woods and maybe he goes way deep in the woods and he gets, he gets turned around, he gets lost. This would be like the deer coming and like, all right, follow me, I'm going to show you the way out, Right? The hunted don't usually help the hunter. But that's exactly what's happening here. That's what exactly Jesus is asking Ananias to do. And 13 through 17, but Ananias answered, Lord, I've heard from many about this man, how much evil he has done to your saints at Jerusalem. And here he has authority from the chief priests to bind all who call on your name. But the Lord said to him, go, go. For he is a chosen instrument of mine to carry my name before the Gentiles and kings and the children of Israel. For I will show him how much he must suffer for the sake of my name. So Ananias departed and entered the house. To me, that's one of the most amazing parts of the story is that the Lord's answer was good enough for Ananias. That he went, he followed Jesus, he trusted him. You know, part of following Jesus, we're guaranteed that Jesus is going to call us into things that we would never want to do on our own. We would never want to do things on our own, and he's going to ask us to step into that. He's going to ask us to step into fearful places or fearful situations. He's going to ask us to trust him, to trust his words and his work more than our own. D.A. Carson says, Faith chases out fear, or fear chases out faith. And for Ananias, he's going to trust Jesus. So Ananias departed and entered the house, and laying his hands on him, he said, Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus who appeared to you on the road by which you came has sent me so that you may regain your sight and be filled with the Holy Spirit. And immediately something like scales fell from his eyes and he regained his sight. Then he rose and was baptized. And taking food, he was strengthened. And for some days, he was with the disciples at Damascus. This is such a beautiful moment um, when we think about it. Ananias had probably knew some of the people who had been persecuted He probably knew some of the people who had been persecuted by the hands of Saul. He might have have known young women who had been widowed because of Saul. He might have known kids who who are now orphaned because of Saul. And yet, even though Saul came to lay hands on him in violence, Now Ananias is laying hands on Saul in grace. In grace. Even Ananias, his his name means God is gracious. That's who Jesus sent to Saul. He would send Ananias, God's grace, to Saul. 
This is the picture of the transformation that Jesus can have in our lives, that an enemy can be a brother, that grace can overwhelm sin, that forgiveness is available. This is the grace that Jesus extends to me and to you because we were, we were enemies. We are sinful. We have been in rebellion against God. And yet he's, he has sent Ananias. He has sent Jesus. He has sent God's grace to us to forgive us, to heal us, to restore us. The one who had persecuted Christ now belongs to Christ forever. Um, we, we never hear about Ananias again. Uh, this is the only place in Scripture this follower of Jesus is recorded. But his obedience is still having a ripple effect through eternity. And I think that's a great reminder to us. We may never know what our obedience to Jesus, what effect that will have in eternity. But we can know that, that as we follow Jesus, that Jesus is at work he is always on the hunt. He's ahead of us. He's seeking and saving the lost, seeking and rescuing even the hardest of hearts. I think that's the, the, one of the great reminders of the story is Saul's transformation reminds us that, that no one is beyond the reach of Christ. No one is beyond the reach of Christ. So often I find myself thinking or, or, or writing off someone, you know, someone in, in family or someone I've known for years, they've heard the gospel, but they've not been receptive to it. Uh, and so you, there's a point in which we almost want to just give up on somebody. And this story reminds us the good news is no one is beyond Christ's reach. That's our bottom line this morning. No one is too far for Jesus. It doesn't matter what sin that they're engaged in. It doesn't matter what worldview they're holding on to today. No one is too far for Jesus. His grace is greater. He can save the most religious of people. He can forgive the most evil of past. He's able to rescue. He's able to redeem. And he's able to restore. And he can transform lives just like he has with Saul. And Saul's encounter with Jesus brought about real changes into his life. In verse 20 through 22, it says, And immediately he proclaimed Jesus in the synagogues, saying, He is the Son of God. And all who heard him were amazed and said, Is not this the man who made havoc? In Jerusalem, of all who called upon this name? And has he not come here for this purpose, to bring them bound before the chief priests? But Saul increased all the more in strength and confounded the Jews who lived in Damascus by proving that Jesus was the Christ. Talk about life change that only Jesus can explain. He was a persecutor of Jesus. And now he's preaching Jesus. He, he was taking lives. He was, he was putting an end to lives. And now he's, he's preaching and proclaiming that there's true life in Christ. He was having people dragged off and locked up in prison. And now he's saying, hey guys, there's freedom. There's freedom in Jesus. Can you imagine that? Can you imagine listening to Saul talk about grace and forgiveness? A man who, who has blood on his hands, and he looks at his own hands and he says, what have I done? And then he looks to Jesus and realizes there's blood on his hands, and he says, what have you done? There's grace. Can you imagine listening to, to, to Saul talk about healing of guilt and shame as he talks about his past and all that he does and he realizes that that was paid for by Christ, that he is forgiven. It is washed away that he's been made righteous, not because of anything that he has done, but based on his faith that Jesus is enough. That's 
life changed. Saul was changed. His message was changed. His mission has changed. And that's what happens as we encounter God in the person of Jesus. And that's why we're so passionate about taking this good news beyond these walls. You know, when I think about next steps for this message, there might be someone in your life that we've written off. And maybe Jesus is calling us to be Ananias to that person, that we would be God's grace to them, and that we would go and we would lay hands on them and show them of God's grace, and we would pray for them and pray that their eyes would be open to Jesus, that they would be filled with the Spirit. Is there a person like that in your life? Would you be willing to go and enter in to a scary place and let your faith in Jesus conquer that fear? Who are you telling your story to? Who are you telling about what Jesus means to you? Jesus is at work all the time. He's at work. He's on the hunt. We get to join him there. And we never write anyone off. No one is too far for Jesus. Some of you even here might be struggling to believe that. That might be sound good to your ears, but at the heart level, you're struggling to believe that's true for you. And I just want to invite you. that If that's you, if if you could be honest enough just to say, hey, I'm really struggling to believe that there's grace for my life and for my past. I just want to invite you to hang out after, after the service today. I would love to encourage you and talk with you to pray for you. God's grace is bigger than your sin. His grace is greater. Let's pray. Father, I thank you that it's true that your grace is greater. When we think about our past, when we think about the sin that's been in our lives, that's In our lives, we thank you that your grace is greater, that Jesus is enough, that he lived for us, he died for us, he was raised to life and now invites us to share in that, to be united to his life, be united and covered in his perfection. I just ask that your spirit would make that true in us, let us Hold on to that. Cling to that truth that your grace is greater than our sin. It's all for your glory. There's nothing we can do. There's nothing we can perform. Just help us to believe. Help us to believe the good news of Jesus. And it's in his name that we ask. Amen.